Today we're going to start out with navigating the body prior to chapter one in the trail guide. This is going to be trail guide edition number six. So there will be some different type of pictures that we'll see today as we go through here. Starting on page five is where we're at. So this is the very beginning. I want you to be aware that as a student, when we are finding all of the bony landmarks of the body, it's very important to understand our skill as a manual therapist or our palpation skill. So this is just showing on the top of the page that number one, you need to visualize what you are touching. What is underneath where your hands or your forearm whatever you're doing your manual technique what is under there and if you're using a tool even more important what's underneath the layers of the skin how many layers of muscles are going through there what muscle are we touching and what is the bone and the bony landmarks so working slower than you think you need to work is extremely important so visualizing what you're trying to access working smart by first locating those bony landmarks or the bone and then self palpation or you trying to find these things on yourself is going to be very very important um, as a student you might be able to talk out loud as it says i think that that is a great way of trying to put in your head what you are trying to touch or what you think you're touching as a way to really understand what you are touching. On the bottom of page five, as I move this up, yes, very interesting picture, number one. I'm not sure if this guy is enjoying what's being done here, but in the paragraph, we want to remember that trying to invite the tissue into your hands is very, very important. Just the weight of your fingers are already setting off receptors in this person's body. They can detect whether our fingers are cold or hot, and those pressure detectors are already going. So the harder that you press is not always better, and in fact going to be putting more stress on those tissues than needs to be. So when you are going deeper, then it's even slower and even slower. And if you close your eyes, that will help you visualize what you are touching, especially in the neck. Um, it's very important to know what you are touching. Turning the page. On the top of page six, we have a couple definitions. Uh, rolling and strumming, which you could also say is going against the grain or against the fiber or the direction of the fibers. As you're going through every chapter, we will look at that architecture, but this is just one of the techniques that you can do perhaps to find the edge, perhaps to identify the bone. Those are all options. At the bottom of page six, um, movement and stillness. If you want to not be able to uh, potentially harm or put too much pressure on someone, you do want to determine the direction of the fiber or the architecture of it. You want to move your hands lightly on that surface, especially when it comes to the bone, and you want to keep your hands still. So if something underneath you is moving, you hold your hands still. And again, the slower you go, the more that you will be able to feel in what you are palpating. On to page seven. Some definitions that you definitely need to know by the time you are done with this entire course. We have active movement, which is where the client or the person that you are doing this work on is doing the work. You ask them to move their leg, they move their leg. The opposite is passive movement. So this is when you as the therapist are moving their arm or their leg and they're not engaged and helping. Um, we wanna remember that needs to be slow and smooth in this passive movement. 
Resisted movement is when both you and the client are participating in this because you are going to ask the client to perform something and you're going to resist that movement or you're going to do something and ask them to resist it. So resisted movements are what are used to distinguish and compare the architecture of the muscle. So the length, the shape, the edges, just all those differences. That's how the visuals in this book are, but that is a common technique that resisted movement will help you identify exactly where you are potentially touching someone. On the bottom of page seven, so we can see here that this is perhaps she's trying to have some forearm muscles um, be a little easier detected in that picture. Page eight um, has a lovely phrase, <laughs> when in doubt, ask the body. Um, and that always will tell you. It's not that there is a specific technique that is going to fix a problem, it is more so in part of your assessment that you need to be doing on that body. Part of it is in your words, in your communication. The other part is figuring out what that body is doing. On this bottom box, these three principles, I, I encourage you strongly to do this in all of the areas that you can on your body. Moving slowly um, and understanding how that feels differently to the part of your forearm that this picture is showing that you're touching, but also what are your fingers feeling as you're doing that grasping technique or whatever you're doing. Avoid using excess pressures. Um, we do have to keep in mind that um, when clients are uh, taking any medication, whether it is over the counter um, or a prescribed medication, we potentially might have those pressure restrictions. And then also, to number three is focusing your awareness on what it is that you are feeling. Is it bone? Is it a particular space on the bone? Is it a tendon? Is it a ligament? Is it a muscle? Or is it just the top superficial layer of skin? Those are all things that you need to be able to identify and know exactly what it is that you're touching. Page nine is talking about creating a journal um, as you go through this course or in learning about the body. Um, surprisingly, I do wish I would have done that because it would be interesting for me to go back in my journey and see how things have developed and changed. Page 10 is a visual that for my chapter test, you will need to be able to identify all the parts but also, if you are going on to take a state exam, this is also something that you could be asked, visually or in words. So from the epidermis all the way down to the blood vessels, I want you to be able to identify all of those areas. This will be probably covered in another anatomy class, but um, it is important to remember that our skin is the largest organ on our body they have an average adult male, which is really hard to say that there's an average, but um, it's nearly 10% of total body weight and covers 19 square feet. And then it does go on to say that the eyelids have the thinnest skin, but also we can appreciate that our palms and the sole of our feet or the plantar surface of our feet are going to have a different type and a little thicker skin. As far as bone, which we're gonna learn about all 206 bones um, and potentially 208 bones in our body. So we do have to remember that the shape and the hardness of a bone and the bony landmarks, those are the easiest things to find. We will be able to find those even if there is a lot of excess tissue that we have to palpate through. Once you know where the bony landmarks or where the bones are in the body, you will always be able to determine what you are touching. So very important for us to remember that information about the bones themselves. On to page 11. So I'm gonna start with the information that's on the top that I have highlighted there. Skeletal muscle is a voluntary contractile tissue that moves the skeleton. In other words, the muscles are moving the bones, right? and it is made up of different types of muscle cells or fibers. There's different layers of connective tissue, 
and we also have our nerve and uh, blood vessels. That second paragraph is what we're talking about or visually seeing in that bottom picture. So we'll go through those in just a moment. Um, before we get on to the visual part, the layer of fascia, which we're going to see on the next page. Um, I kind of wish they would have done this the opposite, but we will be turning back and forth between page 11 and 12 because that will help with our understanding here. So we're going to have the epimyosin, we are going to have the perimyosin, and then we are also going to have the endomyosin. In our terminology, we always want to remember that the term, um, the prefixes endo, peri, and epi will come up again and again. If you don't know what those definitions are, please take the opportunity to perhaps pause this and look those up because that will also help you remember visually what we're identifying in this muscle tissue. The epimyosin all the way down on the bottom is encasing the muscle belly. So you can think of that as the biggest portion. The muscle belly is the biggest portion of the muscle itself. In the middle, we have the perimyosin. So this is those individual bundles of fibers. And you can see how they're identifying three different areas of this perimyosin. And then the last one and the most internal is the endomyosin. So surrounding each layer of fiber that is within that bundle is that very center part. And um, we want to think of how a muscle actually moves. So these individual layers or bundles are going to telescope out, and that's important to remember. Um, there is also an interesting little side note that it wasn't until in the late 60s, 1960s, that they figured out through science that this is how a muscle moves. Prior to that, they thought it was an, like an accordion um, or it kind of folded and unfolded. That's how our muscles moved. That's not that long ago. Um, that was after I was born that they figured out that this is how this is. So we do have to keep in mind that technology advances us forward in very important ways. On the right-hand side of the paragraph at the top, there we're going to talk about the three different characteristics physical characteristics of muscles. The first one is on this page, and then we'll go to the next one page for the other. But the, we have different types of texture. And what we want to think of is, and they're giving you the example of different types of wood. So visually, we can look at muscles and know that the how the architecture is, it is going to be different, just like you um, trained eyes could look at different woods and know by the grains what type of wood that that is. So that is something that eventually, as you go through all of these chapters, that will become more and more evident, and then this will be more and more understanding. Before we turn the page, I do want you to recognize on the bottom box, on page 11, they give you three terms which you absolutely need to know. Um, until the end of your testing career at least, but by then these need to be even more prominent in your assessment skill. Agonist, synergist, and antagonist. Please know those three terms for sure. All right, so now let's continue on with the different characteristics or physical characteristics of the muscles themselves the direction of the muscle fiber, and then the third is what, how that muscle works when it is contracted or going into a relaxed state. So those are all different characteristics that in general, we all have the same muscles, but and they work pretty much the same, but depending on the level of activity of a human, that will also affect what that muscle is like. On the very bottom of page 12, I'm trying to get it all the way up there. So you can see that there is different visuals of muscles here. So you need to not only know the definition of a parallel muscle, but you also need to know the definition of a pinnate muscle 
and you need to know an example of all of these types. So this is just one example of all these different categories. So here's our Panay, we have our parallel, the easiest one in the center is this is a triangular parallel muscle. So all of these definitions you want to know and know an example of. The workbook does go through some more information to help you study these as well. But always refer back to page 12 and I would say at least every two weeks to make sure that these terms are embedded in you and that you are becoming more efficient with knowing these two names and examples of all of them. On to tendons and ligaments. Two more definitions that you absolutely will need to know if you go on and take a, take a state exam. These will be asked to you in some form. So tendon is attaching muscle to bone. Ligament is bone to bone or bone at a joint. You could think of it that way. A tendon is dense connective tissue that is more bundled of those parallel collagen fibers. If you look at the picture right below um, of the bicep, you can see a little bit of the white stuff and that is indicating a tendon. Each muscle is attached to the bone by a tendon. In the second paragraph, we'll also have another definition of another type of tendon, which we will see all throughout this book. We have the apneurosis, which is a broad, flat tendon. We have several of them in our body, and we'll talk about those as we go through each chapter. Ligament is the other definition, again, bone to bone. And a ligament's fibers are more uneven, where a tendon tends to be more dense and parallel. There, there's always differences, but. And then also, if you go to the very bottom, a tendon connects a muscle belly to a bone, but a ligament attaches bone to bone. The, this is important here. And then a tendon will become tight or taut or slack depending on whether or not the muscle belly is contracted, but a ligament will remain taut or tight throughout the entire movement or through whatever the action is. That is also why a ligament might end up with damage versus a tendon being damaged. A lot of times when people have an injury, um, some sort of trauma, they say that you know they twisted their ankle, they did you know, some action. Um, it is not up to us to determine whether or not a tendon has been damaged or a ligament, but just keeping this in mind will help us be able to, in at least in our assessment, be able to know was a muscle damaged or was it the ligament um, and how potentially is that playing with the action that now this client is having difficulty doing. Oh, page 14 is one of my favorite. So I want us to look at the picture first and just take in everything that is going on in this picture. You can see that I've highlighted superficial and deep fascia. And just for the sake of having this picture up, um, we're gonna look at the picture and then I'll make sure that you can see all the areas that I've highlighted at the top. Fascia is a dense connective tissue, a continuous sheet of fibrous membrane located underneath the skin, all around muscles and bones and on our organs. It is a three-dimensional connective tissue and this is how our eyelid is connected to our pinky toe, right? So this is everything that goes through us. Um, uh, there is some, if you go on YouTube, you can look up what fascia is and you will see some lovely videos of why it looks like spider webbing and that's truly what it looks like. Our superficial fascia is right below the skin and covers our entire body. So you can see we have our layer of skin here and then the white, our superficial fascia. The adipose tissue, which we all have just in different layers and different ways, that is right underneath the superficial fascia. And then we get to the next, 
which then goes all the way throughout our muscle, so our deep fascia. In this particular case, this is our forearm as it's showing there, so they are indicating this other type of connective tissue there um, in this picture. What I want you to keep in mind is that one square inch of fascia, whether it is superficial or deep, but one square inch can hold up to 2,000 pounds of pressure. So imagine if I was to put my hand on this person's forearm and apply pressure, I'm going to be adding more tension to the superficial fascia. The adipose tissue is very gelatinous. It's gonna move out of the way, but then I potentially could even put um, more pressure on that deep fascia. So the amount of pressure that we use and whatever our technique is as a manual therapist, we have to keep in mind that we are affecting this superficial and deep fascia. So all of it comes into play in different ways that we do our techniques. So at the top here, just so that you can see the things that I have highlighted, which is just the definition of superficial and deep fascia and how it all lays together. I have there circled at the very end that on the next page are three exercises that I encourage you to do um, on yourself so that you can feel the difference between um, the different areas. The other thing that I want to say about this picture on the bottom is as far as the adipose tissue, we probably have heard um, and maybe we've perhaps felt it on ourselves that we have, you know, I have my, my muscle has a knot in it or do you feel that knot or, you know, can you feel how tight that is the majority of the time? majority, right? It is usually something that has developed in this adipose tissue. Because imagine if this superficial fascia is now recreated a certain way because of how I hold my body or that bone or that muscle, this is also going to be there. So when we have those muscle knots, is what people will call them, and it might move a little bit here or there, it's just made up of this different type of fatty tissue because this is holding it secure and this is holding it secure. Applying more pressure to it is not going to make it better. We have to think of what's a further distance that I can go away from wherever this ball of tension is in order for the superficial and deep fascia to have less tension in them. Um, remember that one, that 2,000 pounds per square inch. So the top of page 15 is where those different areas that I encourage you to palpate on yourself, which you can pause this video and do that now if you choose. But on the bottom is a definition, retinaculum. We'll see that in different chapters all throughout this book. And it is just a, an extra structure um, that is helping to hold the muscles, the tendons, everything in place. So it is a transverse thickening of deep fascia to help strap down those tendons. And if you look at what they're showing here on this talocaryl joint, you can see it's kind of an X shape. There's a, a higher one. Um, we'll define these all in chapter seven, but for now, just knowing the term retinaculum is just that extra stability that is in particular joints because of the type of movements that they're able to do there. Page 16, some more definitions. So we have the difference between an artery and a vein. So an artery is going to be red because it has the oxygenated blood. A vein is the blue because it's deoxygenated blood. And we want to be aware of the arteries and veins. There is some particular ones, and this paragraph mentions one that is the easiest to think about. In um, the lateral aspect of our neck, or the side of our neck, we have our carotid artery. So this blood vessel supplying our head and our neck with what it needs in blood. And we want to keep in mind, especially on our neck, that if we hold pressure, a sustained pressure for a period of time, potentially it's going to affect what they're feeling 
down not only in their neck but down in their arm. Um, and the example they have there of when you are having a blood draw and they put that tight rubber thing on there to make your veins more pop up a little more, that's the same thing that we potentially can do at many different areas of a person's body. So we want to be aware that we don't want to occlude those arteries and veins with too much pressure. Bursa is the next definition. Um, it is a purse-like uh, gel-filled uh, sac. So it has fluid in it to reduce friction between um, a bone or a skin or two structures. They are showing you just in particular where some are located in the knee in this picture. We have them all throughout our body in different areas. And there probably has been a time where you've heard of the term bursitis. So that is just an inflammation of the bursa. We can have a sound that comes out when that bursa sac moves around. So it can be crepitous um, or it can have a cracking or a clicking. It may or may not. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the joint. It's just all differences there. But we do need to be aware that we have bursa all throughout our body um, and what they actually are. Page 17 for our nerves. So by definition, it is a tube-shaped, mobile, and it can be tender when we compress it. They, in particular, in this picture, are showing the brachial plexus. And we do want to keep in mind that no matter where the nerve is located, when we add pressure to it, or it is being compressed or impinged, it can send those uh, nerve sensations or that tingling effect down whatever appendage or wherever that nerve is going to. So we wanna be aware of that. And you will have clients that tell you that they are already experiencing that. So you know that that nerve is being impinged or, or uh, compressed somewhere. So knowing where the nerves come out of our vertebrae is going to be extremely important for you to be able to help that client. And if you go back a little bit in your anatomy, um, all of the nerves come out of either our cervical, thoracic, or lumbar vertebrae, all the way down and including our sacrum. So knowing where a particular nerve stems from or where its base camp is will help you trace what they're experiencing. As far as lymph nodes, just the definition here, we have lymph nodes all throughout our body. So it is part of the lymphatic system. It's one of a lymphatic vessel that has some fluid in it. Um, it could be the size of a pea or a raisin. They can be tender to palpate. Um, the particular ones that we'll go through in this book are pertaining to, especially like right here in the neck. Probably somewhere in your career, you are going to have someone ask you if you can feel their lymph nodes in their neck and do you think that one is bigger or smaller or what should I do? And always it is um, extreme caution that we do not diagnose something going on with a client. More so, we can just advise them to seek medical attention. Um, and then document what and where and what you said and what they said. That is huge. So now we're going to go into page 20. Ooh, let me scoot that down a little bit. So now we're actually starting into chapter one, so navigating the body. And all of the terms that are on this page is for your documentation to be appropriate in your terms. So we have the anterior and posterior view. And yeah, it seems like there's a lot of terms, but there's going to be many of these that you already know and that you don't have to study. Um, you know, palm are, you probably don't have to study, you know that this is the palm of your hand. So use this page to make sure that you know all of these terms. We are going to see some of these terms again as we go through chapter one, but this is also a, a visual of a uh, like little cheat sheet that you could have to make sure that you are using the proper terms in your documentation. Extremely important. Planes of movement on the top of page 21 are up next. And you can see the highlighted area is the definition of each. For ease, I also have indicated here um, these three planes. 
absolutely until the end of your testing career, you need to know these and everything about these planes. Whatever move we do with our body, you're getting up out of the chair, you're sitting in the chair, whatever it is, you are going through all of these planes of movement. So definition, transverse is when we are cutting our body in half. So we have the upper part or the lower part or superior and inferior. And then you need to know what action or what movement is available in that plane and it is rotation. The sagittal plane divides our body from left to right or medial to lateral and flexion and extension are available in this plane. And then the last one is our frontal plane, that anterior and posterior or the front and back of our body as it's dividing it. And adduction and abduction are the movements that are available in that plane. Again, absolutely, positively will be on the chapter test, but also um, as, I, as we go forward into each chapter, I will throw some of those back in the test because you absolutely need to know these for your state exam. The next couple pages are going to be going through some of those terms that we had just a page or so ago. Um, and it's just the definition of them. So superior and inferior, cranial and caudal. These were again in those pictures um, that we started this chapter with. Make sure you know these definitions by the words. We all know that superior is above, inferior is below, but um, technically it is closer to the head or closer to the feet. So make sure that you're looking at these definitions. The same for when we turn the page on to page 22. Um, again, anterior and posterior, which we've already had, and medial and lateral, especially when we just talked about those with the planes but please make sure that you know these definitions by the whole definition. On the bottom, we have distal and proximal, superficial and deep. So making sure you have all those highlighted. More movements at the top, we have extension, excuse me, extension and flexion. They are opposite actions. And the very bottom there, I have that both flexion and extension are taking place on that sagittal plane. If you can't remember where the sagittal plane is, please go back and look at that. Then we have adduction and abduction. And can you remember what plane those were available actions in? On the bottom, we have three different terms medial rotation and lateral rotation, which if you look at this bottom part here, they also can be internal and external rotation when that is occurring at the shoulder and the hip. So just some other terms that might come into play. And then rotation, which pertains to the axial skeleton, the head and the thorax or the vertebral column and that these are what are occurring on the transverse plane. I have page 32 written here because we are going to get to looking at those visuals of the difference between the appendicular and the axial skeleton. You should know what those definitions are, but we will look at those again um, on page 32. Continuing on to page 24 at the top, we have the definition of circumduction, which is going to occur either at the shoulder or the hip joint. Lateral flexion, again, occurs only at the axial skeleton. So another way that we want to remember the difference between the appendicular and the axial skeleton. Um, and again, having that page where you can go to see the difference between those two areas in the skeleton. Elevation and depression occurs either in our scapula or our jaw or our mandible. And then supination and pronation has to do with the forearm. And we are also going to see what the terms that are talking about the feet because they're actually called something else, although commonly people will say that about their feet. 
at the very bottom um, is just an introduction to some of the different terms that you are going to need to know. Um, the scapula is when we're going to cover the bone itself in chapter two, but they're giving us the definition of fossa so that when I give you these terms, you're going to know that it is a um, shallow depression. So there's actually the infraspinous fossa and the supraspinous fossa. So both of those little depressions in there. Still going with our definition of movements, here is what our feet look like. Oops, let me move that down a little bit. We have inversion and eversion. And if you are able to come up with something in your head to remember the difference between these two, that is advisable. You will notice that in inversion, it is the big toe side or the inner arch that is moving. And for eversion, it's the pinky toe side or that outside arch that is moving. So visually, you can see it, but you might need to describe it better in your own terms so that you can always remember that. Plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are a little bit easier. Plantar flexion, which is describing the plantar surface of your foot that is pressing on the gas pedal. And then dorsiflexion is when we do the opposite. We're letting our foot off the gas pedal a little bit. And then on the bottom, we have protraction and retraction having to do with the scapula, the clavicle, our head and jaw, so not anywhere else on our body. And then we have deviation, which is when we do side movements with our jaw. Our scapula can also do deviation. And then we have the special thing about the thumb when we can do opposition because it only occurs there. And it's when you reach your thumb towards your ring finger or towards your pinky, because um, they're saying that it's only the pinky, but it actually occurs at the ring finger as well for that movement of opposition. I want you to make sure that you know those things. Also on the bottom, if you don't have these terms down pat, we have supine, prone, and sideline, always knowing what those positions are. Those will be asked you for sure in some way on your state exam. What I wanna point out on page 26 so know that the next couple pages are where you can turn to as we go through each chapter and you can see all of the actions that are available. But what I want you to notice is what I have highlighted, that the spine and the thorax are movements that are occurring at the vertebral column. What they're showing for the neck is movements that are at the cervical spine and so going forward. Um, if you look onto page 27, we have the scapula, the proper movements would be at the scapulothoracic joint. Um, but I also want you to make sure that you highlight and read through this. We will talk about this more in chapter two, but the scapula not only can go um, more forward or back or anterior or posterior, but it also can do other movements of upward rotation and downward rotation. So this little thing here that we can have more of an anterior tilt or a posterior tilt of our scapula. And sometimes there are a lot of people that that is definitely occurring, which is contributing to some of their dis discomfort or the tension that they're experiencing. The shoulder is our glenohumeral joint and just look at all those actions that you are going to learn in chapter two. But again, this might help you. You might wanna come back to this page after we go through chapter two and make sure that you can identify all of the muscles that are making those bones move in that way. Um, this is a great page for you to do that on your own. Page 28 at the top, we have what we are doing at the elbow and forearm, which is our humeral ulnar or humeral, humeral radial joint, um, and also our proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. Again, great page for you to come back to after we do chapter three, and make sure that you can name out all of the muscles that are making these actions happen at those joints. 
the wrist or the radiocarpal joint. Again, we do these actions all the time. So here is the proper terms for them, flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. But we also have separately some thumb, finger um, actions, but I want you to keep in mind the terms that I have highlighted. Those are the proper terms for thumb and our fingers. And then at the very bottom, we have our mandible or our jaw and just the actions. So after you get through chapter five, again, another great area to come back to and make sure that you can identify all of the muscles that are making those actions happen. Page 30 is finishing out with our pelvis, anterior, posterior, and lateral tilt. Um, and then our hip or what our femur, what is happening at our pelvic girdle um, with our leg. So more terms going on there. The same for from our knee down or our tibial femoral joint. And then at the very bottom, we have those other actions that are occurring at our ankle and with our toes. Again, keeping in mind the proper terms of the name of those joints. So each chapter gives you this review so that you can come back to these pages and be able to identify not only the bones, but all the muscles that are making those actions happen. Page 32 is the one that I mentioned earlier that was going to give us the difference between the axial and the appendicular skeleton. So you can see the difference in the colors is the, the easiest way to think of this. The axial skeleton is the very center, so it includes the skull, the or the, the cranium, the vertebral column, the ribs, the sternum, the hyoid bone, so it's that lighter colored in the very center. The other, all the other things, are the appendicular, which if you remember that that has to do with our appendages, appendages are our arms and our legs, so it's the arms, the legs, but make sure that you know that that includes the scapula and the clavicle as well as the pelvis. So anything that's on the outside of our center is the appendicular and the very center is our axial. Down there at the bottom, just a reminder of how strong our bones are. Um, I know you've ha already gone through perhaps the anatomy course where we talked about the different types of bones but they are very strong, but they can still break or fracture. Just that posterior view of the difference between our axial and appendicular skeleton. And at the very bottom, 15% of our body weight is our bones. So just a little interesting side note for that. All right. The next page has a ton of information, which yay, you get to memorize all of it. The top of page 34, I want you to be able to know that you just have to basically highlight and remember all of this. This is something that you definitely need to know. We are talking about the definition or the different types of joints. The, a joint is the same thing as an articulation. It is a point of contact between bones. How that joint moves or the structure itself is what it is named. We have different types of joints. We have the fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints, which have to do with all of the different type of movement capabilities. When we look at the pictures that are on the bottom, we are talking about synovial joints because there is a joint cavity, but our fibrous and cartilaginous joints do not have that. Within a synovial joint, um, again, much more movement capability. And then we have the six different types of synovial joints which are pictured here. So starting with the ball and socket, and it is capable of movement in every plane. The ellipsoid, which has flexion and extension, abduction and adduction. So I always want you to think about the plane, so what plane allows that? The hinge joint next, doing flexion and extension. The saddle joint, which happens at your thumb. So that is a modified ellipsoid joint. And at the very bottom, we have the gliding joint, which is the least movable of all of them. 
And then we have our pivot joint, which is allowing one bone to rotate around the other. What I want you to make sure is not only do you have all of that information in the paragraphs at the top underlined to make sure that you study that, but I will absolutely guarantee you that you need to know all of these names of the joints, the movement that is allowed at that joint, and an example of this joint. So our ball and socket has movement in every plane, and you could say it is your glenohumeral joint as the example of ball and socket. So that type of information. Your workbook does go through this, so that I would advise you to make copies of this page in your workbook and practice it over and over again. Um, the same with the different terms for the shapes of the muscles. I would strongly advise that as well. For the chapter test, you are not gonna have to know all of these, but by the time you get done and for your final exam, you will. So you will need to know all of these as I've written there, but not for the chapter test because I can't expect you to do know all of those when we haven't gone through them yet. The same for what is pictured on pages 36 and 37, but I do want you to make sure that you have that top little paragraph that is talking about the difference between um, how the muscle attaches, the origin and insertion, and remembering that the insertion site is the most um, movable part of that bone. Down on the bottom is the reason why I'm going to start the process of telling you that yes, visually, you can look at this picture and be able to have a word bank and identify all of them, but you are not gonna be able to memorize every single muscle name in the body at this point. You'll get better and better with that, but just knowing where the muscle is located um, is going to help you. So when we talk about the muscles of the leg, it is, is it located on the front of the leg or the back of the leg? That's what is going to help you. The same for the picture on page 37. So again, you're not gonna need to know these for the chapter test, but by the time we get done, you, you want to be able to identify all of them. And interesting in the little box here that the muscular system is made up of six trillion muscle fibers, but each fiber is thinner than a human hair. Remembering, we saw that picture of how the fibers telescope out, but each one of those little thin fibers can support up to a thousand times of its own weight, which is why our muscles are so different and extremely important to us. On page 38 and 39, no, these are not going to be on your chapter test, but they are there for you to come back to and look at. So at the top here, I've written page 14 because that's one that was talking about the superficial and the deep fascia. But maybe when you get towards the end of your um, chapters that you come back and look at these so you can think of, can I identify all of these muscle layers? And when I look at this picture, which is of the vertebrae, can I make sense of all of these muscles and understanding what I am palpating through? The same with the pictures on page 39. So just at some point, come back and look at all of those to make sure you have a good understanding. Page 40 is our cardiovascular system overview. So you can see a whole lot of information going on there. You don't have to memorize all of these. You don't need to know all of these, but you do need to know that arteries are carrying the blood away from the heart. It's red because it has that oxygenated blood in it. And you do need to know on that right-hand column that the capillaries are where the exchange of nutrition and waste occurs. And then that's what begins to come to um, the deoxygenated blood or what goes to a vein that is gonna carry that blood back to the heart. On the very bottom, we have that little box that's just telling us that uh, if we stretch all of our arteries and veins and capillaries out, it would be for 60,000 miles. That's a whole lot going on inside our body. 
The next page is just showing the different veins. And again, the veins are carrying that oxygen depleted, depleted blood back towards the heart. So that's the blue coloring of it. There is a few arteries and veins that you will need to know as we go through these chapters, but I'll tell you what they are as we're going through them. Just a big overview of the nervous system. We will focus a lot um, in chapter two and chapter five on the brachial plexus. But what I want you to notice is where these nerves are coming out of the body. As I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about what the tube nerve is, all of them are stemming out of your vertebrae. So somewhere from C1 all the way down to your sacrum, somewhere that nerve is coming out. So when people have compression or impingement, you might wanna just turn to this page to be able to identify where it's coming from. So again, this is just an overview of all of it. You don't have to memorize any of these, but I pretty much guarantee you'll be looking at this picture when you're trying to tr uh, trace why a client is experiencing what they're experiencing. The lymphatic system, we mentioned lymph nodes when we were looking at the information right before we got to chapter one. So just an overview of where lymph nodes are located in our body. This is not all of them in this picture, it's just the areas. And we do want to remember that, this, that these lymph nodes do have a job. They're a part of us just helping to fight off different things that are trying to get in our body. So just knowing that they're there and that maybe you will feel these at some point around um, these areas. And that is the very end. So this, this information stems from starting actually on page four is where we started. Um, but I do want you to turn back to the very beginning, page two, just to have the definition of that bony landmark. So we make sure that when we are palpating we can always identify not only the bony landmark, but also the bone that it is attached to. And as they have here, it is a great trail marker.